Here we're told that we have air expanding through a turbine from a given pressure and temperature to an outlet pressure and temperature. The inlet speed is small compared to the exit speed, which is given. The turbine operates at steady state and develops a power output that's given, and there's no heat transfer between the turbine and the surroundings. It's, it's negligible. So we're asked to find the mass flow rate of the air in the exit area. So let me go ahead and sketch out the turbine. So there's the turbine. There's some flow coming in. We'll call that state one. It's flow going out. We'll call that state two. Here's the rotating shaft coming out of the turbine. We're told the power output that's generated by that turbine, and that's given as the 2,500 kilowatts. So we're going to make our control. This is going to be a control volume analysis. And the way I think about this is I'm trying to find the mass flow rate of air and the exit area. As far as the mass flow rate of air, uh, you know, conservation of mass obviously involves the mass flow rate of air, so I'm going to think about using that. Mass flow rate of air also shows up in the first law, so I might have to use that as well. Once I have that mass flow rate of air, I, you know, to find the exit area, what I'm thinking about is if I know the mass flow rate at the exit, and I know the velocity at the exit, if I can find the density at the exit, um, which I probably can find from these uh, from the pressure and temperature at the exit, assuming that air behaves as an ideal gas, I should then be able to get the density at the exit, and then if I have the velocity and density at the exit and the mass flow rate there, I should be able to find the exit area. So I'm thinking applying conservation of mass and the first law to a control volume that's going to surround the turbine. So I need to make sure I draw that control volume. Don't forget to draw your control volumes because that that indicates what it is you're analyzing and it lets everybody else know what it is you're analyzing. So let me start first with conservation of mass and let's see what that gives us. So the time rate of change of mass inside the control volume is the mass flow rate coming in minus the mass flow rate going out. And we're told that the turbine is operating at steady state. What that means is that the mass inside this control volume or any property inside this control volume isn't changing with time. So that means that dm cv dt is zero. So I'll write that that's equal to zero, and I'll put in parentheses next to it y. Just, again, to communicate to everyone why I set that to zero. If it wasn't zero, let's say this was positive, some positive value, then that means some, some mass would be accumulating inside the turbine. So inside that control volume, it would be getting more and more massive. Or if this dm dt term was negative, it means that you'd be depleting mass from inside the tur turbine. Right? By setting it equal to zero, it means the mass inside that control volume is just always the same. Now the mass flow rate going in, uh, I'm not really given that the value of that, so I'm just going to go ahead and call it m dot in. Same with the mass flow rate going out, that'll, that'll be m dot out. And, and I guess the inlet I called state one and the outlet I called state two, so I'll just put those there. So what this ends up telling us is that m dot one is equal to m dot two. It's just the mass flow rate coming in here is going to be the same as the mass flow rate going out there. And for convenience, I'll just call it m dot. Now, it doesn't actually tell me what the value is, so I just know that it, all conservation of mass tells me is that the inlet and outlet mass flow rates are the same. It doesn't give me the magnitude of it, which is what I'm trying to find. So conservation of mass only carries us so far. So the other tool I, we have available is the first law. That involves mass flow rates. So let me write that out. That one is a little longer to write out. There's just more terms in it. So let me write the whole thing out, and then I'll explain it, what each term is, in just a moment. And then we'll make some simplifications to it as well. This is really the way that you want to work these kinds of problems, is you want to write out the governing equations and then simplify them. Don't, don't simplify them you know, in your head first. Just write them out and then simplify it and show everyone why terms are dropping out or why it's, you know, uh, given values. Just it's part of the communications effort. Okay, so now we have the first law. What this is telling us is this is the time rate of change of the total energy in the control volume. We're dealing with the control volume here because there's stuff coming in and out. So this term is going to be zero, again, because it's steady state. We're told that it's steady state. There's, if, if it wasn't steady state, then that means there'd be some accumulation or some depletion of total energy inside that control volume. But we're told it's just operating at steady state, so that's fine. We can set that to zero. Now, the heat transfer term, that will also be zero. 
because we're told that the heat transfer between the turbine and the surroundings is negligible. So negligible heat transfer. So that's given in the problem statement. In practice, that's probably not such a bad assumption, especially if that turbine had some insulation on it, then the heat transfer would be pretty small. The power term here, this is the rate at which the control volume is doing work on the surroundings, that's given, right? That's We're told that that's 2,500 kilowatts. So that's a given. This next term, this is the rate at which total enthalpy comes into our control volume through the inlet. So it's coming in here at one. Remember that this specific enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy, that's sometimes called the total specific enthalpy or H sub T. It's just a kind of a shorthand way to describe all of these terms together. So at the inlet, we're told that uh, the inlet speed is small compared to the exit speed, so that, that's a hint that this specific kinetic energy is negligible. So that's it's about equal to zero. We're told to neglect it. Same with the changes in potential energy. I, I'm going to set that to zero, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. At the outlet, we want to keep the kinetic energy because we're told the speed is uh, 90 meters per second, meaning that it's you know, it's, it's pretty big compared to the inlet for sure, so we'll keep that one in there. I'm neglecting the potential energy terms because, first of all, we're not told anything about the elevations of inlets one and two. You know, for a turbine, typically those elevations might be at best on the order of a, a meter or, or two, something like that. So it's not a big elevation difference. And since we're dealing with air, the density of air is pretty small, so the potential energy changes in air would just be very, very small, certainly compared to the changes in the specific enthalpy. So we're going to neglect changes in potential energy here, set those to zero. Okay, so when we do all that and simplify the first law, we're going to get the following. We're going to get W dot by, I'll bring that to the left-hand side of the equation. I have M dot in times H in minus M dot out times H out plus one-half b squared out. Okay, so that's just simplifying the first law, and I just I move the power term to the left-hand side. Again, we know that the m dot in and the m dot out are the same. And I'm trying to solve for what that m dot is, so let me, let me just isolate it. m dot is equal to the power divided by h in minus h out minus one-half b out squared. So that's how we're going to find the mass flow rate. So it turns out using a combination of conservation of mass, which tells me the inlet and outlet mass flow rates are the same, and the first law, which relates the power to the total enthalpies of mass flow rates, um, that, that's, that's the combination we need to find the mass flow rate. So let's go ahead and write down the things we know. The, the power term we were given is 2,500 kilowatts. We're told the velocity at the outlet was 90 meters per second. Now we need to find the H in and the H out, or the H1 and H2. That I can find given the information about the inlet and the outlet and the fact that we're dealing with air. Okay, so I'm going to assume that the air is an ideal gas. And with that in mind, that means that the specific enthalpy is a function only of the temperature for an ideal gas. So, so then I can look at using an ideal gas table, ideal gas property table for air. Then I can look up what the specific enthalpy is for the inlet and outlet temperature. So H1, or that's Hn, will be... Let me fix that. Will be the specific enthalpy at that temperature of 960 Kelvin. And I can use that table to look that up. And it, when I do that, that comes out to be 1,001 kilojoules per kilogram. And then I can do the same thing for the outlet, or state 2. That temperature there was 450 Kelvin, I believe it was. 
yeah, it's 450 Kelvin. So you look that up in a table, that comes out to be 452.0 kilojoules per kilogram. I'm not going to show the process of looking those up in a table. Uh, hopefully by this time you know how to use the property tables well enough to understand that. So that means I have all the information I need to calculate the mass flow rate. Uh, just one thing you have to be a little careful of is the velocity is given in meters per second whereas the enthalpies are in kilojoules per kilogram. So there's a little unit conversion you have to be careful of there. Okay, so that's a common place where people will make mistakes is in the unit conversion when they add the, the numerical values for these things. So write that out on a piece of paper to be a little more careful with it. Okay, I'm not going to do it here, but I want you to be aware that there's a little, you have to be a little careful with that uh, conversion. Anyway, if you plug in the numbers, the mass flow rate, when all is said and done, comes out to be 4.59 kilograms per second. Okay. And um, so that's that part. Now we're asked to find the exit area. Okay, so we know the mass flow rate at the exit will be the density at the exit times the velocity at the exit times the area of the exit. Oops, I should have keep it as two. I'm trying to find the area of the exit. So that's how we're going to find that. The mass flow rate we know, that's the 4.59 kilograms per second that we just calculated. V2 we know, that's the 90 meters per second. The density at the outlet we can find using the ideal gas law. So from the ideal gas law, pressure is equal to density times the gas constant times the temperature. So the density would be pressure divided by gas constant for air divided by the temperature. And at the exit, we know that information. The exit, we're told that the pressure is one bar, temperature is 450 Kelvin. So P2 is one bar absolute T2 is 450 Kelvin. The gas constant for air, that's a one worth memorizing, it's 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So we could calculate the density. And again, you just there's a little unit conversion converting bar to Pascal. But if you go through all that, the density at 2 comes out to be, let's see, did I... Well, I actually, I flipped it upside down, so it would be 1 over 1.292 cubic meters per kilogram. I actually did it in terms of specific volume, 1.292 cubic meters per kilogram. Okay, and we'll just remember specific volume is like 1 over the density. So now we have everything we need, and we can calculate the area at the exit. And when you do that, it comes out to be 0 0.0658 square meters. All right, so let's just kind of quickly recap what we did for this problem. We were asked to find the mass flow rate, so one of the first things I did was just try to think of expressions that involve mass flow rate. Uh, certainly conservation of mass involves mass flow rate, so we applied conservation of mass to a control volume surrounding the turbine, and all that told us was the mass flow rate coming in and the mass flow rate going out were the same. So we need something else that Something else was the first law applied to that same control volume. Since that involves mass flow rate, you can see it is involved here. We made some simplifications, knowing that we're at steady state, negligible heat transfer, neglecting the inlet velocity, neglecting changes in potential energy. Rearrange that, and then we could solve for the mass flow rate. And to find these specific enthalpies at the inlet and outlet, you had to use the ideal gas property table for air, just recognizing that that specific enthalpy is only function of temperature for an ideal gas. To find the area at the exit, we just said that the mass flow rate at the exits, uh, the density times the velocity times the area, or if you prefer, you could do it in terms of specific volume. It would be velocity times area divided by the specific volume. This is all at the exit. We found the specific volume or density at the exit using the ideal gas law. And then we could do the calculation. Again, just have to be a little careful with some unit conversions in here. And with that, we'll go ahead and end the example.